Hello, welcome to Feedback episode number 32. We're joined today by Marina Rosenfeld and Han Kai Wong, and we'll be chatting with them about the works My Body and Death Star Orchestra, featured on the recent album out on Shelter Press. Uh, we're coming to you from the past today in pre-recorded form, but please feel free to shoot us questions in the chats on YouTube or Facebook. We'll be watching that in real time. And uh, yeah, really excited about today's conversation. So hand it over to you, Hong Kai. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, Marina. Um, so, well, I have known Marina for years, right? I think so. But I never yeah. got... But I never got a chance to tell you I first uh, came across your work at Whitney Philip Morris. Really? Yes. Oh um, <laughs> like 20 years ago? I think so. I think so. Oh. Yeah. And, but the reason I brought this up, because, um, you know, I have seen and heard many, many um, live performances, but that work of yours, the Sheer Frost Orchestra, I still remember it very vividly. Maybe not necessarily the sound of it, but I remember the space. I remember the space very, very well. I remember sitting. I don't know if I was sitting on the chair or was just sitting on the floor. I don't floor. think there were any chairs. But it was okay, so I was space with the sort of sloping low steps. Okay, okay, right. So, you know, I, I think it was 2001, right? I think so. 2001, 2000, and mm -hmm. I moved to New York in 1998. So I was still relatively fresh and new as a foreigner and I didn't really quite know what avant-garde music or new music was at the time. So I think for me, it was really, really, really special. And it, it, I think it blew my mind. I remember it blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but because I was, I was remembering, I was, t and now I'm, I'm sharing you with my memory. So. And I think it reminds me of that kind of experience when I watch a movie. I, you know, maybe I didn't quite, I don't quite understand the movie, but years later, I still remember the feeling, you know, the feeling of what it doesn't matter whether I fell asleep at the time or I was distracted. So um, I think like right now thinking of it and remembering, I, I, I think I have a very uh, rather poetic relationship to your work uh, through my memory of it, you know, from being in your work as an audience. And I remember the space, I remember the warmth of sitting uh, alongside all of those audiences. I remember, um, I remember, um, the bodies of the, all the female performers very, very well. Um, and the attentiveness of all the participants, including the performers and the audience. And then also the um, materiality, you know, how they were playing with the nail polish uh, bottle. And I think at that time for me, there was it was it blow it blew it was blowing my mind, but there was also a lot of uh, mystery, like as to how how this piece came about. But I was there in that space, so I think that's really incredible. 
That was so long ago. I'm trying to remember what the year was. I'm not entirely sure. I know that um, the first Sheer Frost Orchestra in New York City was at Green Naftali Gallery mm-hmm. back when it was in the late 90s. And it was when um, that there was only basically Carol Green's gallery on 26th Street. It was mm-hmm. all like truck depots and stuff. And the ground okay. floor of the space was like a raw, well, basically a garage space, which is where we mounted it uh, with all these artists. So the Whitney one came a little later, um, but I remember that night very well too. It was, um, it was, a, it had a really special energy. And I actually, I now when you're describing that, I got like a little, um, <laughs> I don't know, I got like a physical feeling thinking about it of like ah. being inside that mirror, that all that windowed um, atrium ground floor mm. space that right. was in Philip Morris. It was just north or just south of uh, um, Grand Central Station. And it had windows all around. And I remember the people lining up to come see this piece. And I was so shocked, actually, that mm-hmm. like th- this line of people started to accumulate and went all the way around the block and disappeared like on 41st Street or whatever was happening over there. I was mm. really astonished. Mm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like at that time, I was not an informed or um, I was not an informed um, listener. And so I think to see something like this, um, it really affected my, how, how could I say it, like a selfhood, you know, what, 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 like what it means to, you know, to watch a female composer working a lot with all of these female artists who are, you know, who are artists and perform on, on their own right to, you know, to make this such a, like, a interesting sonic ensemble. Yeah, but I mean, it was all artists in it. Uh, I'm just, I'm trying to reconstruct who was in that one. I, know I think oh, Ikue Mori was in it. Ikue Mori, Barbara yeah. performed. Right. Kiara, Kiara Givondo. It was a really interesting group of women. Right, but it right, speaks right. to the importance of the the bodies, the liveness. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. the um, the kind of reserve actually that that piece uh, manifests. It's kind of uh, it's not very active. It's it's quite still for most of it, even though there's the great concentration required in the making the sound gestures. But it's very right. still. It's almost like a tableau vivant. Thing. But but that <laughs> intensity, that kind of intensity, intensity, that kind of stillness, were very very intense, very intense. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. But today we're not talking about that piece. But that's a great story. <laughs> Thank you. For that. That's awesome. <laughs> but I, I brought I it up no because, because I brought it up because I think it would be uh, for me uh, who haven't experienced or listened to my body and the death star in the real space in the, in the, in the real time, as if I I experience. Um, in my headphone um, alone at my home, it, which is not really much, it, which is not a social space. So I think today I would be interested in conjuring, like, uh, like uh, asking you, <laughs> I would love to uh, ask you to conjure the social space of my, star, uh, my body and the Death Star for the online audience. Well, if, if we can do that, that'll be great. <laughs> yeah, let's try it. <laughs> so, yes. So, um, should I ask a question? I mean, uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, I, my mind is um, spinning a little just thinking about your introduction. So it's so great. Um, but it's funny that I called um, that it was a funny decision in, in the moment to, to call the, the work for you guys, um, my body. Mm. But I wanted, I actually really wanted to, um, there was something about, so the, the piece is based on me sharing with you the suite of dub plates that I made. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the material on them is like very, uh, it sounds sort of, it's, it's, it's synthetic, but it, with a little bit of my voice, but it all has the feeling of the voice. It has the the structure of like utterances to me, or I made them that way. 
and um it felt a little bit like like it to me it's quite funny like to share it's sort of like handing out my body to the four mm -hmm. guys <laughs> wow. in the ensemble to do as you will with or as as i've instructed you with <laughs> <laughs> as it says in the score <laughs> So I see some pictures coming up. Yeah. So what are the instructions, Marina? Um, well, maybe I should look at the score while I say this. So I make sure I remember. Um, hold on here. So, well, th the instructions are there. I think there are eight parts and um, the each I, I tried to treat each movement in, for this piece as I think I described it as like both a musical and a social situation. So there's some kind of sociality that is uh, mustered or proposed or enacted and each time a little bit differently in each movement. The first movement is just a kind of an opportunity to hear the plates. So that one is the most like declarative. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, um, once the, the dub plates are start, everyone has a turntable in the ensemble. And once everyone starts to have the opportunity to manipulate these or listen to them or play against them or with them, um, it's, I mean, maybe Laura or Ian can speak to this better. It, there are certain, there were challenges set in a way, I guess, for you, like how to, how to, for instance, manipulate it by hand and track the coming and going and the sort of rising and falling of the events on there with an instrument that isn't really designed for that or how to um, kind of produce like the um, decays that happen when you slow down the mechanical playback and things kind of slowly devolve how to produce those sounds with other instruments. Yeah, there's definitely a learning curve for that. It's um, not necessarily in my uh, technical wheelhouse, even as a, a musician who's done lots of crazy things that don't involve playing the piano, um, manipulating a turntable in that way was not something I ever done. And so, yeah, it was really, really interesting how sensitive it is as an instrument. I think that really tactile sort of uh, experience of the, like <clears throat> like you were saying, the beginning and the ends of sounds and, and how speed relates to that and how it changes it so much. Um, that was really, that was really cool. That's one of my favorite things about the piece actually, personally. It's one of the things I had uh, a lot of fun doing. I love that you describe it as sensitive because that, you know, if you think of like records and record players as, you know, it's like a very high end way of reproducing a sound. If everything is going right and the it's tuned properly and weighted and so on and the needle is good, then it, it's actually, you know, one of the most high fidelity um, modes of reproducing a sound that we have. So if you begin to handle it, um, the, it is kind of i think that's the first thing people experience is it's oversensitive like it will be immediately destroyed as long as you're thinking along those lines so you have to figure out how to um destruct with um precision <laughs> it, it, it is it's funny that it does demand a lot of precision um but then also like some of the movements um we were just chatting about this before the podcast here um like the sixth movement, which is for Ning and Laura at a single piano, the, the two pianists of your ensemble. Um, I wrote it just to, it's almost like you, the two of you become one body in that. And you're, it's sort of in a, it's like my, I think it's definitely inspired by Marta and Georgi Kurtag at the piano and their closeness that I've, that I really appreciate from there when they play together if people know who those, who those two wonderful human beings are. Um, but that you, that I wrote those, these big chords where like one person has to have their arm come back, come around um, the back. They're, they're, you're sort of embracing in that, in that piece. We That's exactly the word I was thinking of. Photographs yeah. of it. 
You have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. <laughs> There's a way that I always enjoyed watching that movement because I think it, it kind of forced you and Ning into um, like a different articulation on the instrument that I wasn't used mm -hmm. to. Um, kind of like the the barrier to your normal mode of playing just mm -hmm. created this unique situation. Yeah, definitely. It, it took away that like super direct attack that the piano has and it's this like really uh, all sometimes uncertain sort of mushy kind of transitory kind of thing. Yeah, it was really cool. And what about for Russell? I, I'm thinking back to how it felt to play this, to play this thing. And I remember there's like, I mean, there's multiple movements and each movement, even though there's some similar sounds because of the dub plates, um, our approach to it is totally different. You know, like the instrumentation, if I'm remembering correctly, is different for each, each movement. And so yeah, like, I feel like it's completely different. Yeah, it's cool. It's like this set of scenes that you enter and there's almost no beginning and no end to each, you know, in, in some sense. Um, and I really thought that kind of openness uh, was really fascinating in terms of, you know, performance, but also like learning how, how to play this music, how to listen to those dub plates, um, how to react to it. And then also, you know, in the notated music, um, like with the vibraphone, duo you know that that took some figuring out like what is our choreography for that you know um it's similar but different to to what happened with laura and ning and there's just so many different things that happen in this piece but um these dub plates really ground it somehow you know and it's it's really interesting it was great to i, I i'm thinking back on the process now and, and remembering that we started the rehearsal process for this without, I hadn't really written the piece yet entirely. It was right. in the kind of, what I had was this idea of kind of like, um, I really didn't want this to feel like a, a formal concert. I, I never want my music to be in the frontal concert I'm totally so I'm so uninterested in that. And I thought, oh, it would be nice if I'm going to be distributing these materials. It would be nice if it's sort of like we're visiting each other. So it, I think, remember telling you guys, we have to, even if we don't have anything to say, we should chat a little bit as we move from station to station or place to place. And like just say hello in the piece or come over and hand somebody something or borrow another, borrow a pebble or take a drumstick or whatever is going on there. So it was like, um, the structure of the of sort of like visitations and social gathering in different configurations plus these sounds was really what I brought initially to the rehearsal process. Um, mm. And it's great for an artist to work with people who are open to kind of make the work with you. So uh, some of the stuff that looks very formalized now in the score um, became that way quite rapidly over the two weeks that we yeah. set aside to um, just figure out like everything that we could extract. And you know, you, thinking of you coming over here, um, I mean, you live relatively close to our space. So there's also that like kind of neighborly aspect of like meeting here and like bring in the turntables and finding a time, you know I mean? It was very, yeah. it was very local and very, that's really nice. I thought, you know, just that it, it wasn't like you're coming from, I don't know, out of town or something. We were able to just meet here down the street, you know, um, to exchange ideas. I thought that was fun. And when we were, you were performing on stage formally, the you know the interaction between all of you was there still like very much rehearsed, or there there was room for improvisation. I think we more or less had a plan um, of like the paths we would take around the setup, and mm -hmm. I was just thinking like um, just kind of a play on on the title, Marina that. It was something that we had to kind of like get in our bodies, the, the path through the setup, 
And I think I remember maybe in the dress rehearsal, or maybe the performance, like taking a step in the wrong direction <laughs> and then needing to make like, a quick U-turn back to get the dub plate from Laura that I had to then bring over to, there was some like delivery mechanism. No, it was a little complicated. Yeah, I had to go over there. There yeah. were only four plates, but there were like five or six stations where they could yeah. go. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah there, we didn't get a little bit of traffic. Yeah, that yeah. was a little stressful. I remember that. I was like, oh no, I got to get this dub plate from Marina. Uh, when am I going to do that? Because I'm in performance mode, you know, and I'm like, okay, I got to stay focused. And then I wrote myself a little note. Go get plate. I was like, ah. We're giving away all our trade secrets. <laughs> yeah. But I think the um, what comes across hearing you guys talk about it to me is just that um, this this really worked out well in in a way as a kind of meeting place between something that's always been like the modality where I get to perform as a composer who's also creating works for other people as long as I'm in the context of my dub plate and turntableism, then I get to play. And it's not, I, I kind of do it less and less, but I still love it very much. And um, uh, it's not so obvious how that would integrate with um, other kinds of the, the form of giving a work to somebody with ideas in it. Um, so this was a really just an experiment that um, I think bears repeating or developing because it wasn't that's that's also the, this idea of my body. It was kind of like um, uh, really like the a hybrid uh, between two kind of parallel strands in my practice. Totally. How long have you been working with each other? For this, we just met for a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, it was um, for the time spent it was festival. last year and not this summer because this summer's festival didn't happen, I guess. That is true. And actually the sounds, um, it's funny because I thought, you know, like I'm just getting started with this synthesizer that I was working with. Um, so I didn't even in the program notes for this concert, I didn't even, there, there was already so much content and so much interesting things to think about the materiality of these plates, mm-hmm. this kind of social listening. And like, it was a very rich palette of ideas for me already that I suppressed like that sort of third interesting thing about it. Cause I thought I'd be going right back and working on it more. And then, you know, this year hasn't been possible, but all the sounds on the plate are from um, this machine called a voter which mm-hmm. is this early, early, maybe the first um, speech synthesizer mm. that they have a prototype of out at Nokia Bell Labs out in New Jersey, where I'm an artist in residence, but I haven't been able to go back and work with it since then. So I just have this like precious recording session of recorded sounds that I made as a complete amateur on this weird kind of like secretarial machine from the, from the late 30s. Um, so wow. that also hopefully eventually I get to go back out there. But. I had no idea about those sounds. They, they sound like they're otherworldly, you know, but, and, but yet so alive or something. So that kind of makes sense that it's a vocal kind of synth. You know what they are? They're, um, they're from a machine that you see that on the camera. It has slots for each finger or like pads, these sort of levers, and a foot pedal, and it's super weird. But it's a you play it as if you were taking a dictation, or t- the idea would be like the boss man would be giving you his important words, and you would be synthesizing his speech, as, almost like a in a in a secretarial mo- mode. So it's kind of an incredible weird machine where you can produce like the inflections of speech utterances in a kind of like a typewriter weird it's but what, very very interesting i like it a lot what was it supposed to it was it's not to, a musical instrument it was supposed to record what what the person no, was saying it was supposed to be able that you would record these um uh you could I, I don't really know. It doesn't even work in, entirely. There's like no one yeah. that knows how to fix parts of it that are broken. 
But I, the idea is that I think someone at the World's Fair in like 1939 or some, something oh. um, was able to make it say like, good morning. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Like in someone else's voice. That's it's really like pretty vocoder and everything. It's a yeah. really, it's a really funky, strange. It's got this. Little, it's like a little wooden desk. You're weird. When I saw it out there, I went crazy. I was like, you, I, I just made, made it, made it possible somehow that I could go back <laughs> and spend a day with this thing. But I'm, I really would like to continue learning how to use it. Yeah. This was like, really early level, improvisation with the. <laughs> That's cool. Should we listen to a short clip of my body? Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Um, should we do movement eight? Does that sound yeah. good? Oh, okay. So that's the end. That's the end. Or would you like to choose another one? No, that would be nice. Good? I love movement eight. Cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
<laughs> maybe hey, you beautiful. have to tell people what the sound is. So there's two two sounds, right? There's stones. Did we both? We all had stones, I think. We all had stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we rub them together, and they kind of they make this filter sound depending on sorry depending on like how you cup your hand. You could change mm. like a filter, um, and then same same thing when you strike it, you can change kind of the pitch a little bit. So we we're all striking those, and then I think both Ian and I had finger symbols or maybe just me i don't i don't we all needed one sound we could make at some mm. point right that's right but basically the, we, that's what we discovered in the rehearsal was yeah. so beautiful that the rubbing two pebbles together was a lot like the sound of the surface um static on these dub plates as they start to get worn in they yeah. make more and more of that noise the more the more you play them they're sort of losing some of their signal and you hear the material itself and it was so close to the stone two stones mm. so yeah. um at the end of everyone having you know kind of like man in many cases manually rotated these discs then they were kind of just rotating two stones mm. yeah that was cool well marina i i i pick um, I chose to I chose for us to listen to move, movement eight because I love the sound. I love to I love the fact that I could listen to it at home in a domestic setting, and which is has become a kind of new social at this pandemic time. Um, but I love it because it's I can I can I can hear and sense this very strong sensuality sensuality in that this is specific movement and I think the quietness um, somehow um, offer a listening space not only for me but also for me to listen to how you guys might listen to each other and I really appreciate that so having said that could you talk about a little bit how you listen to each other like when performing, when making this, my body together on stage. Hmm. Well, I think each each movement was different, um, right? But it is there is intense listening. You can't just like go and play your part. You know, um, there's a set maybe of actions that we know that we're gonna perform in each thing, but. Um, you know, given duration is pretty open, if I'm remembering correctly. And so we're really, I think for myself, at least, I don't want to speak for Ian and Laura, like I'm listening in terms of pacing and really kind of trying to sense the environment of each movement. So for this one, you know, I want to hear the crackle of the dub plate, you know, and understand what's going on there. And and I hear Ian rubbing his stones and I'm, I'm doing the same. And, and it, there is some kind of social element to it. I feel like as performers, rather than performing these things, we're kind of like, I don't know how to really explain it, but we're, I don't know, making, making a texture together, kind of like what you're talking about, Marina, you know, we're imitating this thing. Um, and it's not that we're imitating each other or the dub plate necessarily, but we're just trying to maybe meld you know, and um, I mean, there's definitely something interesting about like these liminal dynamics. Like I was just thinking about you saying that, like riding the fader on because in that last movement, you guys are all doing these stones. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just brought in like the last track on the dub plate, which is just surface noise with a few pops. Um, but just riding that fader to keep it just at what seems to be the same level or just under the level of this really small sound. So everyone is kind of leaning in um, to listen to the, just these, ab like a abrasion really. Yeah, that listening in is really important actually. And it's also as a performer, you know, you wanna make a sound and make sure people hear it. But in this case, you have to, at least I had to like kind of get rid of that and just be like, this is the volume of this sound. 
and it's going to exist. I think everyone by that last movement was kind of like, yeah, (laughs) totally. (laughs) The, I, the audience was in the round, so everyone was kind of like leaning into the center yeah. a little bit. What about for Ian and Laura? You know, yeah, I was I was thinking about that actually. I, I interpreted your question just a little bit differently than Russell, I, I think, at first, um, which is that it's funny, actually, the longer we play together, the less I think about listening it just happens more effortlessly it's like i i don't think it's not as conscious all the time Mm -hmm. but i will say it is also easier and i think i i'm a better listener when i'm not like thinking about listen make sure you're listening do the listening it's like it has to be something that feels very organic in what we're all doing and i think the material that we have to work with in a piece like this is it it there's just no other way to do it without listening so it's not something that's that's sort of like on the forefront of my mind you know mm. like this little place it's just it is it is what's happening is that we're listening to each other um which is one of the another one of the things i think is really special about this piece mm. i yeah. Could I could I respond to that, Laura, real quick? It's like I, sure. I feel like we like typically when we um, play contemporary music or whatever, um, it's like goal oriented or something. There's like an arc, mm. you know, and we, there you're like if you're you were tasked with completing this piece, you know, um, and it's a very specific way of, of performing music, right? It's like almost, uh, if you're going on a hike, there's a goal to the hike, right? You're going to reach the summit and then that's like your, you know, what it's all about. But this, this piece in particular and other pieces that I've actually been enjoying a lot, um, lately are less goal oriented, you know, and more Mm -hmm. process oriented, um, where like, I actually enjoy taking hikes where I don't know where I'm going to go and I might listen to what's happening around instead of worrying if I'm going to make it to the summit or something like that. You know what I mean? And like, that's kind of the act of listening that I feel like this piece encourages. Um, like I feel like I could put movement eight on repeat for, I don't know. I won't give it a goal. (laughs) X amount of time. (laughs) Um, I mean, we could actually, it would be interesting to, there's no time limits on these movements. Mm. One could spend longer trying to just make these subtle adjustments. I was just thinking that um, there's another one of the movements where I used this um, concept that I first developed in the uh, work around 2014, um, I think, uh, which I think of as disunison where I'm like generating as complex, it has to start with a certain amount of complexity, difficult rhythmic patterns and get excellent musicians like yourselves to play them really tight. It has to be hard to really focus. And that in that sense, there's a strong goal to get the unison. And then the next gesture is to make the disunison, which is the, the, the prying apart of the unisons, but keeping it kind of in a swarm, like a, cloud-like rhythmic um, blurring. And um, that's a specific technique in the, one of the movements where all four of you play. Cause it, a lot, most of it, only two people are playing or this two or that, you know, or it's not all two T, um, but that could be also, one could think of that as a more meta structure. Maybe do, the, do that to the whole piece. Yeah. <laughs> There's no reason not to, in a sense. It's it's all just kind of proposals for states of close attention and different kinds of little abrasions and things like that. So could work. I think we should move on to um, the Death Star. Yeah. Sure. Should we begin by listening to a short clip of Death Star? Sounds good. When when is good? Do you think, Marina? To 
drop into this? Um, and this I is mean, the reduction, the, right? It's the fourth side of the record. There, there are four sides. It's the fourth. That's I, ha, I, I'm the. So the first side is the Death Star installation, mm -hmm. and then the second side is some of the occasions where the all of the I, I generated notations from the sound installation I made. It's kind of like this um, microphone sculpture that produced a really intense amount of distortion and kind of mm. like um, it's sort of in a con what I described as a continuous or like a um, generative state of composition inside the space because of these microphone delays and feeding and feeding back and then just architectural distortion. So the second side is the first concert inside the installation with the pianist Marino Fomenti um performing the sound the notations transcribed from the installation and then the third was the death star orchestration for ensemble and piano um which was for ensemble music fabrique in um cologne and then the fourth was this reduction down from the orchestra to chamber music so maybe maybe the fourth side somewhere in there it's all you guys Cool. Um, it's some in the studio and some from the concert we did um, summer of 2019. Um, again, with Marino Fermenti, who's an Italian pianist, um, as the kind of um, solo voice. And you guys Yay. are the orchestration. <laughs> we love Marino. Shout out. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> he was here tonight. I'm just looking at my part right now. I really, I really dig minute nineteen. All right. You want to listen to minute? Well, I don't know if it's. <laughs> it might be different in the recording. I had to. Not only is it the reduction, but then you know to fit on like what oh, yeah. happened for you in the concert at minute nineteen. It might not be minute nineteen. Of That's the, true. That's the true. Side. But we can just drop the needle somewhere and see what. Let's do. <laughs> yes. Wait, what minute, happens at minute nineteen? Well, in my part, it just says uh, minute nineteen is. It's um, I'm using a Reibstock and a piccolo woodblock. <laughs> and Classic. That one Russell is that bass instrument on a rope. Yes, and oh, that was that when was Russell was moment. being the bull roar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Had go. to be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right.
Awesome. Nice. The Marina, the piano sound was recorded, pre-recorded. No, um, in this case, um, the the piano is live. Ah. He's reading these ever denser notations derived from the last version. So it went from this really simple piano in the installation two years earlier, which I played. And right. then over these different transcriptions, it it takes it like this, the, the system I'm using means that it's, it's recuperating more sound. So at this point, at the end of this chain of events, it becomes very, it, it has a real intense density that he brings to it. And then the ensemble is there fleshing out the orchestration. Because mm. I can hear, um, I can hear this very strong reverberation. Is that from the recording of the, the museum, the, the, the porticus? Some of that is in there. It's at that point, it's sort of the end of the chain reaction. You know, like mm -hmm. it's just, um, it's posing questions from my side about where the music is. Is it in mm -hmm. the notes? Is it in the trace, the memory of the event? Mm -hmm. Is it live in the manifestation or the sort of the, the act of it, the, the enactment now? Is it, which it's sort of like um, commentary upon commentary. So it's mm -hmm. one, version is speaking to the previous one mm -hmm. so at that point it just it's kind of I mean I'm curious what your how you listen to something like that because I know I'm so deep I'm still very deep inside this particular project and I have my a little bit of distance now but when I'm listening I'm really quite aware that I'm almost listening from too much inside mm -hmm. you know what I mean Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think for me, I when I was listening to it, I very quickly, I was very quickly aware that I was being transported um, between different spaces. But then very soon, I it, can't, it just dawned, it just dawned on me that I'm actually in all these spaces um, simultaneously and. And to respond to what you said, you said, where is the music? And I think for me, the music is kind of in, I, I wouldn't say everywhere, but the music is where I, I think the music is uh, where I, uh, how do I say it? <laughs> um, I think the music is where I move between all these spaces. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Where you're placing your attention almost? Yes, or? yes, yeah. yes, yeah. That's and, cool. and I think for me, I when I listen to uh, Death Star, it's, it's a very unusual uh, listening experience because I have to be, I have to be, I have to listen very attentively to look for the music. But I think that kind of search, that kind of seeking, it's probably for me. That's where the music is. So I move. Yeah. So I move I together that. with your sound. Yeah. I hope people will um, take. If anyone ends up listening to it, that, that take that <laughs> time to to um, you know if you start with the first side of the first record, you're just most almost the whole like most of what you're listening to is this just kind of like spectrally diverse white mm -hmm. note room tone with events that come and go so it's really a journey also through mm -hmm. these different it's a little bit like the history of music or something from my personal subjective standpoint and new instruments the discovery of the voice um discovery of transcription and communication of an idea to another another person, another intelligence comes in. You know, mm -hmm, it starts mm -hmm. to be a conversation between me and Marino. Um, and then these other, the, the ensemble almost has like a negative 
capacity. They're kind of a there's some kind of dialectic there they, where they interrupt the specificity of the music with the, like the genericness of concert music mm -hmm. in a way. And then they're kind of banished and this other, the, this, the reduction, which is yarn wire, um, mm -hmm. comes close again. It sort of like becomes attenuated and then it becomes intimate again, but then it just really, like that section we were just listening to, it just really explodes in the end. I mean, there are explosions along the way also. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of opportunity. The reason why Marino is playing so heavy, heavily, frequently, mm -hmm. is because the transcriptions that I made from the space, mm -hmm. the, in the initial instance of the first installation, um, I drew. I, I I used a kind of graphic style. I drew these vertical extensions through a lot of notes. There were like these big black lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that try to say that pitch is what's at the center of this, but actually there's a lot more activity on the spectrum going above that note or below or both. So he's playing clusters with his forearms a lot, but he's just so accurate. So you still hear the chord, but then you also get like, I don't know how he does it, but he, <laughs> he figured it out. Cause it, the, the, the pitches of the chords are there's an inner structure that is very specific that you hear it comes back again and again and again. Mm. It's the same chords and he's playing those, but then there's just this other kind of massive wash of other material. So when Yell and Wire come into this chain of events, like, <laughs> um, how do you, how do you begin the process of, of engaging with this? What is your process? I think the first step was to, to just listen to, to the material that came before and kind of inhabit that, that space for a little while. And then at least, I think speaking for me, for Russell, uh, me and Russell, um, it was kind of just imagining first imagining what a reduction of that material might sound like and and in no way attempting to recreate what it was but kind of drawing essences out of that material i think i'm remembering that correctly but i don't know russell what do you, uh, <laughs> do you remember can you what i remember is that um this one if we're going to compare it to like my body um, this one was very different and I feel like yeah. we were trying, like we have a pair, there's like a percussion pair in this reduction. And then there's Laura and Ning who are the piano pair. Um, mm -hmm. and we're all these kind of like, we, both the percussion pair and, and Laura and Ning, I feel like we're, like you said, Marina, we're the resonances of, of Marino, you know, and and so I feel like the very beginning, I was just literally trying to think like, what is my role here? Like what, how do I fit into this, this thing, you know? And um, it really only became clear when we started doing rehearsals with Marino in the studio, you know, yeah. we could kind yeah. of map stuff out. Yeah. And then he came and it, it became a little bit more clear what, what these roles were. And they were less chamber music, at least to me, and more like these separate islands that were kind of like inhabiting these different resonances or different spaces and stuff like that. And then when we got into Demena Center in Manhattan for the performance, we kind of blew that apart even more. You know, we were all so separated. And so physically we were in different spaces. Sonically we were generating different spaces but also all the material that had come before that you're playing through the speakers and stuff were also these different spaces and so in in some way i kind of had to tune the rest of it out in order to like be in my space like um, ian and i were being our our thing and and trying to make sure that we had our own thing going and so i haven't yeah. really heard the piece as a spectator or or a listener in in mm. space you know, until this recording. Yeah, I it's think awesome. it's complicated to listen to. I, I think it'll take it'll take shape over time as the project did, maybe. 
yeah. just to figure out like um what's going on and it's so dense at times and then like totally attenuated at other times but um you describing this this kind of like i was just thinking also in the Demena center where this was performed and when this recording we just listened to was made um we didn't use any pa at all i only used the for any sound reinforcement we only used the kind of light amplification that they have in this built it behind these wall panels that the orchestra that practices there use for like simulating um concert hall acoustics yeah there was no pa in the space and no speakers so it's just like a little extra was coming out of the walls very distributed like no non not directional at all and then these guitar amps that we were using to amplify some of the instruments (coughs) um so it was like just yeah like pretty weird decision and very specific staging decisions <laughs> yeah it's good because yeah. there's all these different types guys of were reinforcement such good sports in oh it's fun <laughs> coming back to this like oh do you remember overhead projectors yeah from like elementary school and junior high and stuff like i was looking for one today you were yeah just ran uh, <laughs> but just like if things were like placed on an overhead projector you would still like you would still see the object but it would every layer on top of it would color the objects below it but you could still choose to focus on the objects beneath they would just you would just have to gaze through them through other layers of objects i don't know yeah i feel like people yeah who are checking it out could like experience it and so like looking at those layers like you're talking about and look, listening to the different spaces like you're talking about Honkai, you know, like mm-hmm. just there's so many things you could pay attention to. And I feel like a little bummed that I had to perform, you know, and couldn't really, you know, let my attention wander. Um, yeah. But it, there's a lot going on. I think it's really cool. And what about Flora? Yeah, I mean, I think Russell's description of, of his experience is similar in a lot of like he and Ian used a lot of the same words that I would use Uh, I think the only difference is that you know uh, I think and we I feel like this sort of we talk about this in a number of episodes in some ways the role of a percussionist is so fluid in some ways musically in terms of the instruments they use what their role is oftentimes whether they're providing texture timbre melody, rhythm, you know, or maybe all of the above. And for pianists, you know, our role is usually so much more clearly defined uh, as our instrument. And so Nick and I, though, are not functioning like that at all. And I felt more very closely tied to Marino during this performance um, and very unaware of what Ian and Russell were doing at all. (laughs) usual. So even though Nick and I, yeah. I felt like Ning and I, we were, because we were only manipulating the inside of the piano, like a giant resonator box. Um, We weren't playing on the keys at all. Um, And so I feel like we just sort of bonded our, our attention to Marino's progression through the score, Mm -hmm. through what he was doing um, and tried to sort of enhance and draw out, like Marino was saying and Russell was saying these important moments where do we enhance where do we support where where maybe even we contrast in some way um to highlight attention so yeah it's uh, yeah so very similar but with that one little difference mm. so marina um can you talk a little bit more about how this piece um, evolved through all these different forms so why is that in what is that important in Death Star? I mean, I think I it happened in a sometimes there are just these moments, I think, in a lifetime where an opportunity presents itself and it's irresistible. And for me it was in 2017 that I had a almost simultaneous or two halves of the year, an invitation to mount um two things in the same region of Germany, really, like in Frankfurt and Cologne to do this exhibition in Porticus and to create a work for the Donau-Eschingen Music Festival uh, later that year. 
And I knew that the work in Porticus would involve sound. And I knew that um, I was going to be working with this ensemble. And I had gotten in touch with Marino about the Dano Eschingen concert. And um, I thought like my work really has um, caused me to kind of work on this problem all the time anyway like this like what does what is the um why is it so different to be in a live performance or in a more attenuated or kind of mediated relation to sound as a composer and someone working also in installation and with sometimes with objects these two things concert installation like it was an opportunity to um pose the question in tandem together. So I mm -hmm. asked Marino if he would be part of the exhibition in a kind of preparatory way for the orchestra concert. And it just snowballed. It was so interesting and complicated and confusing. And um, it let me ask all the questions I'd been mulling over about, um, you know, like the importance of a site. What does it mean to be in a site? What were these massive kind of like um, psycho like a like I had these kind of aversions I wanted to examine to the classical music format itself, or mm -hmm. a sense that it would destroy my work or not make make it possible for me to do what I was trying to do in these other contexts. So to mount this huge sonic, it was like two and a half months of sound in Porticus, wow. and then distill that down with these notations. And then to turn that to sort of like, not just transcribe it, but also, of course, change, tra like, in a way, to, I took the opportunity to destroy it myself before the concert would destroy it. So I, I wrote like, I made it very complex for the orchestra to sound like an orchestra. I put a whole wall of guitar amps in front of the stage so you couldn't see them. And then I put Marino, the pianist, in the far back of the hall um so that he seemed to be in a different in a different room and like heavily amplified him through these guitar amps so i tried to like already destroy the um possibility that the concert would sound like a sonification of the electronics mm -hmm. it was already kind of um i just yeah like i tweaked everything to try to produce the kind of a non-site or to make it really obvious to myself what were the, or to try to discover what were these strange ideas and feelings that I had about this idea of a concert. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from there, then it just, it, musically it began to really develop and it led to one more version. And also because once I was in dialogue with Marino, who's a very uh, fierce intellect also as an artist, the work became kind of dialogic. Mm. Or it had been very much about like, again, some kind of manifestation of my vocality and my um, sort of identification with these sites. And... Mm. That's great. I have to listen to all all four of the oh, okay, yeah. back to back to back to back now with this with this in mind. We get Yeah, and just it. like really playing with weird ways of amplifying, you know, like try I'm still really working on this question like what why is the amplified signal so different from the other one? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so much more I'm really interested in, you know, like it used to be I was interested in speakers. Mm. I went through a long phase in my work of PA systems and PAs and horn speakers and directional speakers. And at this point, I don't care as much about speakers. I'm really interested in the microphone and just the, di the diffusion of the signal and how does it, where does it go? And what what is that curious, trend? it's like alchemical change, especially to voices and to like known things, things that we recognize. And then the, what are those relationships like to their to the acoustic analog, like the stones and the surface of the record or things like that? Yeah. Really looking at the like um, 
it's like a sculpture material for me, the voice, the amplified voice. Man, a lot to think about. <laughs> <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> that was too long of an answer. No, 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 not at all. That's awesome. Although um, I do think we are reaching our, our, um, okay. our end point in time, I'm sorry to say, although I know we can chat for a long time. Um, but man, Marina and Honkai, thank you so much for being here today. This was an amazing conversation and I really cannot recommend enough checking out the Death Star record on Shelter Press. Um, our next episode is on Tuesday, December 15th, where we'll be talking with Wang Lu and Melissa Smay. And um, please remember to subscribe to the Yarnwire channel so you do not miss an episode. Um, one last note. If you'd like to support this project, please visit our patreon.com page. You can become a patron and receive cool bonuses like custom ringtones made by Laura and Russell, bonus playlists from our featured artists, and uh, download codes for the Yarnwire series and more. Go bag. Uh, and a tote bag. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Gotta have a tote bag. <laughs> Gotta have a tote bag. So yeah. Thanks Thank a lot. you. See Thank you. Soon. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.